Well, here's the table I wanted you to see set in the garden of a friend. It's a teak table, about 51 inches in diameter. Now let's look at the construction details. There are eight segments which form the perimeter. And then there's a cross in the middle of the same thickness as the end pieces, joined together with mortise and tenon. Then there's a series of thinner slats that are set in a groove and spaced so the water can go through and the table can dry. Directly beneath the cross are the vertical supports. That leads to another cross piece where it's been relieved. So there are only four points where it actually hits the turf. And there's a hole for an umbrella. It's just the right height. It's real comfortable to sit at, have dinner, and enjoy the garden. The patio table that you just saw was built out of teak, and that's a great outdoor wood. We're going to build ours with cypress. We've had good luck with cypress. It holds up well outdoors. It's a little softer and lighter than teak. It doesn't have the silica that's in teak, so it's a little bit easier on the tools. And when it's finished, it looks beautiful. I want to get started today working on the top of the table. It's formed by taking two pieces of four inch stock that cross in the middle with a half lap joint. Around the perimeter, there are going to be eight segments, which will form an octagon, which will later be cut into the circle. The field of each quadrant will be filled with some slats that fit into a groove. Now, the first thing I want to do is half lap that joint in the center. To do that, I'm going to use my radial arm. But before you use any power tools, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. I've set up the radio with a stacked dado head cutter, about 5 eighths of an inch in width, and I've run some samples so that I have an exact half lap joint. Now all I have to do is plow out the material. Okay, let's see how we did. Perfect. With my dado cutter, I've just made a groove in one of the cross pieces to receive the slats. I make that groove on all four sides of the cross piece. Whenever I build a segmented form like this, the measurements have to be very precise or it's not going to come together correctly. I'm going to use my framing square to mark the lengths of the cross piece. I can check the inner intersection for squareness and then I can mark my length. I'll use the square at each intersection and that will assure me that each piece will be exactly the same length. Here I'm beginning to form the tenons on the ends of the cross piece which are going to receive the perimeter of the table. I've set the height to make the top edge of the tenon. After I've done the four ends, I'll raise the blade and do the bottom side of the tenon. On the underside of the cross for the table, I'm laying out for some mortises which will receive tenons from the legs that support the table. Now I'm making the mortises the way carpenters have been making mortises for centuries. Start out with a drill, drill out as much of the material as possible, and then I'll clean it up with a nice sharp chisel. One of the tools that makes cleaning out these mortises a little bit easier is this special chisel. It's a corner chisel designed to clean out mortises. Whew. 
Now I'm beginning to form the slats which are going to fill in the field of the table. And this is a very precise job if I want nice tight joints and nice even spaces. Each slat is a little more than an inch and 13 sixteenths wide and the space is 3 sixteenths. So that means that each slat, which is cut at a 45 degree angle, will get longer by two slat widths and two spaces, which is four and a sixteenth inches. Now this is the next piece in the sequence, and before I remove it from the miter box, I'm gonna mark the length. I don't want to mass produce all the pieces now. I want to verify that this field is right, and then I'll do the remaining three fields. The next operation on the slats is to cut the tenons, and this is where a very precise miter gauge is important. Now, I've made the first pass on one end. To do the other end, I have to turn the miter gauge 45 degrees on the other side of zero, and then complete that. Okay, let's see how that fits. That's good, on to the next one. Now we've worked our way out to the edge of the cross pieces. And you can see that this extends a bit beyond the tenon. And that's okay, that's what I want. I'm gonna take my square, line it up with this shoulder, Put a pencil mark. I'm going to go back a half inch, trim it off, and form a tenon here, which will fit into the segments of the octagon. First, we'll cut them to length. Now we'll form the tenon. Okay, let's check this one out. Nice and even on that end. And this end. After I finish forming the last three, we can chamfer the edges at the router station. There are a couple of reasons for chamfering the edges of the slats. One is purely decorative. The other is that as you run your hand over the table, you won't catch a sharp edge and get a splinter. Now we're ready to start working on the segments of the octagon. Before the segments of the octagon will meet the cross brace, I need to mill a groove to receive the tenon from the cross piece and the slat. Here I'm getting ready to cut the segments for the octagon. I've set my most accurate miter gauge to 22 and a half degrees, which is the angle of the cut, one half of 45 degrees. Now here's the end that I just cut of the first segment. I'm going to slide it on to the center piece, and I have indicator marks which show me where it should line up. I'm not going to cut the other end yet. I want to confirm the lengths of the pieces for the octagon. Now I'll cut a piece that'll go on the end of this section of the cross piece. Okay, now here's the second piece, which I'll also line up on the center of the cross piece. And here's a piece without a groove, which is going to fit between the two segments that I've already cut. I've laid out the theoretical measurement of what it should be. Now if I set it on top of these pieces, it should meet. But as you can see, it's slightly off. This piece needs to be a little bit longer. I simply can't make this piece longer. I have to compensate in two ways. I want to slide this piece a little bit closer to the segment I'm getting ready to cut. Slide this one over just a little bit. And then I'll make this piece just a little bit longer. These are very fussy measurements if you want it to come out right. Okay, let's see how we did. Slide this piece in. That joint's good, the inside's even. And the same thing is true here. Now I can use this piece as a template to cut the remaining seven pieces. All right, well, that takes care of all the segments for the octagon, all nicely fitted. The next step is to make a groove 
at each of those joints for a spline that's going to hold the pieces together. To make the groove for those splines, I'm going to use my tenoning jig. I need to hold the piece vertically as I run it through the dado. This tool allows me to clamp the piece in place so that it's safe to push it through. Well, for the last few minutes, I've made two more slats, which will complete the field. The ends were rabbited the same way as the rest of the field, and I chamfered the edges at the router table. Now I'm going to dry fit the pieces in. These two will go in here. And I can slide my segment of the octagon in place and just temporarily clamp it. And then spread these back out again so you get nice, even spacing. Next comes the segment of the octagon. And I'm using some splines that are made out of half-inch stock. And you'll notice that the grain runs across the material. If it ran up and down, it would just split. This will give it the most strength. So there'll be one of those at every joint. A lot of glue surface area there. You slide in like that. And make sure everything spaces out OK. And that looks good. Now there's one more thing that I want to do. And that's chamfer the inside edge of this octagon segment. Because I don't want to catch any slivers there. Once that's done and I've fitted the rest of the pieces, we'll be able to glue up this top. Well, now I'm ready for a little assembly. I've disassembled the dry fit. I'm using some yellow carpenter's glue. This is a weatherproof glue. We've used it before on outdoor projects, and it holds up really well. I'll put a coat on this half lap first, slip it together, and then reinstall the slats. Now I'll reinstall the slats. And I'm not going to get them perfectly set right now. A little bit later, I'll pin them from the underside with some brads. Now I'm going to put two of the octagon segments on that fit over the cross piece. And even though all the pieces are exactly the same, I'm glad that I labeled them. So they go back together exactly the same way as the dry fit. You're probably wondering why I'm not using my foaming polyurethane glue, which we do like for outdoor projects. But it does foam quite a bit, and it might be tough to clean up between these slats. And besides, we've had good luck with this type of adhesive. OK, now one clamp across in this direction. And I'm double checking to make sure that my witness marks line up perfectly with the cross piece. Now I can glue two more pieces on and slip in the remaining slats. Now another clamp. Well, now I'm ready to start completing the octagon, the remaining segments. For each of those, I have to put glue on the spline and in the slot that I cut in each individual segment, as well as on the end grain. OK, now I can slip this piece in. And I'm going to have to speed things up a bit, because I can't put a clamp on this until I get the opposing segment glued and set in place. OK, two to go. And that glue is setting. Well, now it's just a matter of circling the wagon and tapping these joints to try to remove any gaps that might be remaining. OK, I'd say that that's about as good as we're going to get it. Well, before I leave tonight, I want to secure these slats so they won't move around. I have this little adapter on the end of my glue bottle, which allows me to squeeze a little bit of glue in there. And that'll help hold the slats in place. Well, good morning. Last night, the table set up nicely in the clamps. 
This morning I'm taking some time to sand all the joints nice and smooth. And then we'll be ready to move on to the next step. All right, now what I want to do is convert this octagon into a round table. To make the cut, I'm going to use a jig on the bandsaw. Now, I made this jig years ago. It's just a piece of three-quarter inch plywood, a couple spacer blocks, and another piece of plywood with some screws that go through. The top piece slips onto the table of the bandsaw, and I slide it over till it's just about up against the blade and then just drive the screws so that it squeezes onto the table. Okay, that's nice and secure. Now I always make sure that the center line of my jig is right even with the leading edge, the tooth side of the bandsaw blade. Now today I want to have a 25 inch radius, so I put my tape up against the saw blade, run it right down the center line, and then I can put a mark here where I'll drill a quarter inch hole for a dowel pin. Now I need a corresponding hole in the table top. And now I'm going to measure 25 inches from this hole to the edge and then trim it so I can set it on the jig. Now you'll see why this cut is important in a minute, but I have to have one point along the perimeter of this octagon that measures the radius of the finished top, 25 inches. Otherwise, I won't be able to get it on the jig. There we go. Now, turn the bandsaw on and just slowly rotate it around. perfect circle every time. Now we'll just clean up the edges a little bit. To ease the edges of our table top, I'm using a 3 8 inch radius roundover bit. I'm going to round over the top and the bottom edge. Now that the top is complete, I can start working on a pedestal to support it. Just as with the top, I've taken two pieces of stock and half lap them in the middle. And this will create the base that will sit on the ground. Now once again, I'm drilling out for some mortises, which will receive the legs of the pedestal. Once they're all drilled out, I'll clean them up with a chisel. If you tried to set this base right on the ground of your patio, it would be pretty unlikely that it would not wobble. So by adding these half inch thick pads at the end of each piece, I get a little bit of a foot and that'll allow it to sit flat. Here are the blanks for the legs. I need a tenon on each end. So I've pulled my rip fence back to act as a gauge. It's one inch from this side of the blade. I've raised the blade to 3 8 of an inch to make the shoulder cut on each face. I'm going to raise my blade to 1 half inch and make the cuts in the edges and nibble away the waste material. Thank you. 
now I've switched over to my tenon cutter to make the cheek cuts. To treat the corners of our legs, I could just use a simple roundover bit. But since I have this beading bit, by making two passes, I get a nice bead right along each corner. Now, if there's anything I hate, is stubbing my toe on the base of a table. So everything down along the bottom should be rounded over so there's no sharp edges. Now, even though I glued these slats in place, I didn't use very much glue. So I'm taking the extra precaution of driving a one and a quarter inch brad down through each slat. That way I know they're not gonna go anywhere. Well, now it's time to attach the legs to the table top and then to the base. There are no mechanical connections here, just some glue on the tenon and in the mortise. There's a lot of glue surface area and I'm not worried about this coming apart at all. Now this is where I'd like to have four arms, one for each leg, but sneak it on there. All right, that seems to be pretty good. Now I'll just add a clamp at each leg and let it set for a few minutes until the glue starts to dry. Okay, that should do it. While that's drying, we'll set up the paint shop. Several years ago, we built an outdoor lidded bench out of cypress, and we didn't put a finish on it. We were hoping that the wood would turn a nice light silvery gray, like teak or cedar does. The project has held together well, but we're disappointed in the look. It's kind of dark and blotchy. So for our project today, I'm putting on a protective finish it's actually a combination of oil and alkyd resins. They use it on boats, decks, and outdoor furniture. It has UV protection, and it repels water and snow. So that should give our piece plenty of protection. All it takes is one liberal coat applied with the foam brush. You can see over the whole corner. Now to cut these dovetails, I'm going to use a new jig that I'll use with my router. It's made out of highly machined aluminum. It has fingers, which can be adjusted for any dovetail layout that I want. There's a MDF board on each side as a sacrificial strip. I cut the pins on this side, and I cut the tails on the other side. There are two handles, which make it handy to guide on my router table. Now let me show you how I set up the pieces. I take some quarter inch spacers and set them on top of the fingers. Then I take the tailboard with the inside against the jig and against this little stop. Then I take the pin board again with the inside facing the jig, 